Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve with Aikmo Krav Maga, which means my buddy Alan. We're both instructors here in uh, Pompano Beach, Florida, at the American Israeli Krav Maga organization. Uh, doing the best we can to stay sane during this uh, period of isolation. Uh, we've been doing some online classes and um, that type of thing. It's, it's it's not ideal, but at least we're able to keep uh, some of our students in shape and uh, keep them busy and keep uh, keep everybody sane. So that's an important thing. But it got us thinking about, despite how these are not the ideal circumstances to teach a very comprehensive self-defense system, uh, at least it's something. And we were wondering what else is going on out there? What else are people teaching? And people started emailing us and calling and saying, hey, uh, obviously your school is closed right now, but when this is all over, we'd like to go check out your school. Uh, we also have seen stuff on the internet where people are asking, well, how do you choose a school? I've been thinking about doing something when this is all over. I've gained some weight. I want to get fit. I've, thinking, I've been thinking about taking self-defense for a while. Uh, how do I choose a good school? All these things prompted us to make this little video here today. So you don't have to choose our video. Maybe you're not local. Maybe you're not in the South Florida area. Uh, maybe you're not looking for something like Krav Maga. You're looking for something else, something more, more traditional, uh, whatever that might be. But there are certain things you should look for in a school and certain red flags and warning signs when you uh, pick a school. So we're here to give you some. I have a short list. I'm going to sort of bring these up. And Al and I are going to give you our thoughts on how to do this and how to pick a good school and how to stay away from the bad ones. Uh, we've both been veterans of self-defense and martial arts for, for, for decades, and uh, maybe this will be useful to you, all right? The first one, and this is in no particular order, um, and this may have happened to you, I've seen a few schools where I've walked in and I'm greeted by uh, a seven-year-old wearing, you know, black belt, several stripes on that black belt, and, uh, you know, I have to call them sir. I don't know if this has happened to you, but uh, it definitely, yeah, uh, I've seen that for sure. I've definitely seen kids with black belts. Yeah. Which is a weird thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that some schools go out of their way to say, look, you know, until a certain age, you can get this far in the ranking system, and then once you reach a certain level of maturity, then a black belt's an appropriate thing. I think it's not just about how much you can memorize, but also there's a certain level of emotional and mental maturity that has to come with that rank. This is a different, a different culture in different systems right you know whereas in, in say jujitsu uh legitimate schools it takes forever they, you move up in the ranks very slowly because they don't give you anything till they think you deserve it right there's no expectation that after a year i'll have this belt it's a meritocracy that it's, just it doesn't great. matter right um and there's a lot of, there's there's schools who are like we'll just promise you after three years this is what you're gonna have and pay for it all right now right the black belt factory yeah, so that's definitely something that you should look out for. Uh, again, if a school that you're looking at, uh, you've been checking the school out, it's, it's in your neighborhood, or a friend of yours recommended it, if they have some of these characters, that doesn't necessarily make them a bad school. But it definitely should be on your radar, you know? Having just one or two of these traits doesn't make it a bad school, but just be aware. Uh, here's another one, and this is, a, this is a good one. If your sensei, your shihan, your sifu, your... Whatever, whatever you call your instructor, if that person is teaching a no-touch knockout or a technique that doesn't require actual touch to knock someone out, would you say that's a, that's a red flag? It's just make-believe. I, I don't even know what to say to that. I mean, I mean, you can say it, it's it's almost a cultic mentality. It's people that sort of brainwashed into believing it or they're just playing along with the, the culture at their gym. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And there's lots of good things like that. Let's face it. It's just not real. And you can see videos of people demonstrating how not real it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just them trying to do their moves against a reporter who doesn't believe in what they're doing and just nothing happens. Fantastic. I love the excuse that the guy gives. I think it was, um, who, who am I thinking of? <sighs> Had a reporter come in and was going to do this technique, and if, if, if it didn't work, it's because the reporter – well, if your uh, your big toe is facing down, your big toe is facing up. And or you the, put your tongue in your mouth. You can nullify it. You can nullify it, right. And then we had this other guy who is 
doing this type of thing and his students are like falling everywhere. Yeah. And then he was challenged by this guy who's, I don't even know if he was what, what level of MMA or what level of, of he, I think he, he may have been an amateur, but he, amateur he was fighter. a fighter. He was a fighter and, and got up, destroyed. It was actually sad to watch. Yeah. And you can like see the moment where he's realizing, where he's questioning reality, like, wait a minute, this doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not great. And then this, this leads into the cult of personality. So um, anything that vaguely resembles Cobra Kai is also probably not a good thing. If your instructor is uh, having you spar someone else and you have your partner on the ground, I'm saying partner, not opponent, and uh, your instructor's words are, now finish the job, finish him, that's pretty horrifying. Uh so anything that resembles unless, Cobra Kai is bad. Unless he's encouraging you to go for specific submission. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's okay, look, now that's a good place to do, you know, a rear naked, that's a good place to do a little plot. That's different. But if he's yeah, saying, like you know, yeah, why why is that guy still conscious? Aren't you gonna finish the job? That that's that's terrible. So you know, it's just like a Roman Emperor just you know, doing one of these. Um here's a good one. Uh <laughs> I found this one online. Um, somebody said that a sign of a bad school or an iffy school is too many patches on your uniform. What's your take on that? I, I don't know. I don't. None of the things I ever did, we didn't have patches. So yeah, I don't know what. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's like you know, some some jujitsu schools people collect patches for for different things. It's just. That doesn't mean anything. You went to a competition or something. Yeah, all right. And I, get I, I yeah. get that. I get that. I mean, from like, I'm not big on on, on patches. Um, you know, here at this school, we got some some pants that we work with. Um, they're good for indoor and outdoor use. They're pretty tough. They have pockets because we often have to carry a knife or a gun or some type of improvised weapon or stuff like that, or be able to like pull out a a, a bean bag, which we use in, in, in place of a wallet. So because we're simulating. You know, street crime and stuff like that, uh, and just a basic T-shirt. So uh, we're not really big on patches. I do think though that if your school has patches, like I mean, you look like a Boy Scout. I mean, you have you know mm. badges all over the place representing so many different things. I do think it's it's just it's awfully distract. It seems really convoluted and really distracting. And, you know, it, it it might seem weird. I don't know. Um, here's one. If you have to break the bank to earn a rank, look at that, it even rhymes. If you have to break the bank to earn a rank, that's, I don't know. Um, I don't know, because uh, when I did jujitsu, it was pretty expensive. And, and some things can be like certain workshops and certain very famous people. I understand yeah. that. But if, if what you're doing is getting a belt test, I don't think it should be something where you know, it's, it's an enormous amount of money. It should be where like, you know, I'm gonna have to go donate plasma and not eat for a month so I can afford my belt test. I don't think that's a good sign. I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think that's a great sign. You know, uh, here's one that you were talking about the cult of personality, the cult yeah. of master worship. What's your take on that? Um, well, it's just, it's just rife for abuse. Really? Yeah. If so if someone is that idolized and everybody's, you know, it's it's one thing. It's one thing in a traditional styles. You have to address people certain ways. And you have sure. To bow, and it's a it's just a okay. traditional thing. Sure, I, I get that. I, I but sure. if they expect Absolutely. that outside of class, that same sort of deference, that's a little strange. Yeah, I I, I get that. Um, I. Uh... And this happens to us all the time, you know, we're, if I'm out and about and uh, I bump into a student, you know, uh, it's the, the younger ones and they say, oh, it's, it's, it's Mr. Steve's and no, it's just Steve outside of class. And, you know, we definitely don't have people call us instructor or, or in, in Hebrew, it'd be madrich, but we don't have anybody call us madrich, you know, um, we're instructors, but it's not a title per se. I, I do worry about when people do exactly that, where you have to like, you bump into somebody at uh, Trader Joe's and you have to like, you know, immediately start, you know, and you have to walk out, you know, facing them, walking in reverse because you don't want to give their back 
That actually happened. I, I was in South America in the very early days when uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was expanding into other you know, countries and stuff like that. And I was a part of an informal group that was training some Americans living abroad. And we went to go to different schools to do an open tournament, invitation for an open tournament just for people to, you know, come and, you know, just, uh, you know, spar. And just, you know, because we were just five guys uh, with one instructor. And we didn't see, you know, people coming and try it out. And um, I went to one man's office and he was wearing this silk robe with rings. Okay. And he looked like, you know, the Kung Fu version of the Godfather. And as I'm talking to this guy, we, we have to address as, uh, I forget what odd title he had, something along the lines of another word for grandmaster, a student of his in full uniform entered, brought him tea, bowed, and then walked out backwards. He had to moonwalk his way out of the office. And some of his diplomas were in a strange language. Well, that's a language that, uh, I was revealed to me when I was meditating in a cave in, like, in, in Nepal. It's like just very odd stuff. It's like you're doing some. You're in. It's like you're in a Qing Dynasty reenactment society. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's like you're gonna have to kowtow, start wearing your right, your, wearing a pigtail. <laughs> right, and people were doing that. And the guy would walk around, you know, with with his hands in his robe like this, and you know, it's very odd. And look, I, I like Renaissance fairs. But those people know that they're doing make believe. You know, I get it. You appreciate the culture, but that when they go overboard with that, they, you gotta you gotta chill. That's a little too much. All right. Um, here's one. Uh, when your instructor, the guy you're gonna pay to teach you classes, if that person refuses to demonstrate with you or spar with you or personally show you a move, that could be a red flag. So what do, you, what do you think that's an indication of, Alan, when someone says, well, let me call so-and-so over to do it with you? Not because they say, look, I, I'm, I'm clearly injured or whatever. And like, no, I just say, you know, I don't do that with students. I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't spar with students. Or I, don't, I don't do stuff with students because I'm, I'm afraid to injure them. It's way too lethal. Yeah, it's something, it's something you don't see in, in people who are doing more practical or even sports-oriented things. Yeah. They will they will get in and do it with you, you know. Yeah. If uh like jujitsu as an example, just because you know the way they, they train, like if a high level guy comes and visits your gym, he may roll with everybody. You may just jump in and show people stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also nice because it you know, it's it's a different atmosphere. There's yeah. not there's not an arrogance to like, oh, I'm not I'm not working with those people. You know? Oh yeah. Like, yeah, I can, I'm not gonna work with them. No, no, you're not good enough. To yeah, work. that kind of master snobbery. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've seen that. We, uh, we before the COVID nineteen crisis, we had a friend of mine, uh, Gleason Tebow, who's just a, a legend in the UFC. Really nice guy, shirt off his back, nice. He came in and did a workshop with us, and he worked out with everybody. He was with people who had been here uh, for a month. He was with, uh, he, he practiced with us, and he was just absolutely gracious and nice to everybody it's a true sign of uh to me what 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 a, what a real fighter real instructor should be so that's the kind of person you want to look for i can remember i can I remember seeing a video of uh i think it was billy robinson old catch wrestler and like at a, at a time when he couldn't walk without a cane oh man but he'd get if someone wasn't doing a technique right he was trying to explain he would still get on the mat and try and show it yeah. You know, you can barely move anymore, but like, oh, you guys, you guys are doing this wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's, we'll get in and do it. That's great. That, that, that's a sign of a true instructor, you know? Uh, here's one, uh, a need for conformity. So, for example, um, when I've, 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 from an anthropological point of view, as a student of, of various cultures in my life, and as, as someone who studied anthropology in college and archaeology, I have a fascination with world cultures. So I wanted to travel and see different styles for myself just as a form of, cultural interest, you know, just uh, check it out. I must have taken a week of, a week, two weeks, three weeks of pretty much every, you know, obscure style that I could find for my entire life. And I've always found that fascinating, you know? Not to knock it, not to prove it wrong, nothing like that, just as a genuine interest how this culture expresses itself through self-defense, you know? And uh, I've seen times where someone would show you a technique and I'd say, well, what's this for? And they'd say, well, that's just the way it's done. You say, well, why? So because that's the way it was taught to me by my master and his master before him and his master before yeah. him. And 
Nobody seems to know, but that move still exists. We never use it, but that's it's there. It's in, it's in the particular form or pattern, or, you know. So that that's a that's a weird thing. I don't think there's a place for that in, in you know modern self defense systems, do you? And the need to conform to a certain way to do something, not dogmatically. Yeah, it's, well, I mean, there's 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 a there's a few questions there. One, you know, one is um, if you're doing if you're doing it for self defense reasons, right? Then you don't want to waste your time with anything that isn't going to work, and you don't want to waste your time with something that's going to take that may work eventually, but it's going to take forever to learn. Yeah. So. And things that you don't even know why you're doing, then I, I, don't, know, I don't know what the point would be. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. So the, these are just things that come up that you should be aware of, you know? Um, here's, here's something else that, uh, that we're thinking. If you're going to choose a self-defense school, why? What is your goal? So, for example, if you say, look, I love the beauty and then the, the peacefulness and the grace of Tai Chi Chuan. Okay. You sign up for a Tai Chi class, you're going in with your eyes wide open, you're doing it because you like the breathing, and someone told you had the different postures that stimulate the acupressure on your feet, and then you want to you know, channel your chi, all that stuff, look, I'm not knocking it. You, if you have, that's what you want for your life, and that's that's your goal, is to feel peaceful and relaxed and breathe, and you have some, you have a belief in, some, in an energy within you, then that's fine. But if you go into Tai Chi or uh, a system where they say, and this also is a lethal martial art, you can use this. When someone comes to grab you outside a supermarket, you can do this, this, and that. You have to start taking that with a serious grain of salt. Serious grain of salt. Because, look, if you're sacrificing practicality, pragmatism for dogma and, 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 and metaphysics and things that just are not very realistic in a real situation, then you're gonna, you, you have to be aware and make that choice consciously. You know, uh, avoid stereotypes. Here's one. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid, uh, you'd hear conversations with people because everybody growing up, if you lived in suburbia in America, that's what you did. There was piano lessons. There was Boy Scouts. There was the, the, the local karate school. Everybody had extracurriculars. But you always hear kids on the playground say, I go to karate. Yeah, me too. Yeah, but is your instructor Japanese? Mine is. Well, because the instructor was Japanese, that made it more legitimate. And what we're seeing with Krav Maga is that, um, you know, everybody with an Israeli accent can come to America and pass themselves off as the Zohan. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. First of all, I've lived in Israel, I can tell you, it's a citizen army. Everybody and their mother, literally everybody and their mother did army service. Okay? And you did some Krav Maga during basic, but then there's Krav Maga you do during basic, just like if you go to the army here in America and you do... Uh, uh, you do, you know, you go to basic training somewhere. Yeah, you fired a weapon, but that doesn't make you, you know, a highly trained sniper with, you know, uh, medals for, you know, uh, action in Afghanistan. It's just a very different thing, you know. So uh, that that used to happen a whole lot, and it's, I still see it happening now. You know, there are great instructors for BJJ who are not Brazilian. All right, fantastic instructors. There are great Krav Maga instructors, not Israeli. Great uh, Taekwondo instructors that are not Korean. So just be mindful of those stereotypes. That doesn't necessarily make it more or less legitimate. What should make it more legitimate is look at their resumes. You know, I mean, if you were going to go, say you were going to go take a judo class, would it matter to you if the man is Japanese? Or what would be the thing you would look for to see if that, you know, would you look at the man or his resume? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're trying trying to learn. I mean, if you're trying to learn it and you want to compete, then you want to know, like, how good this school is, how good are the people there, how good are the instructors. But even that is, you know, that can tell you what they know. It doesn't tell you if they're a good teacher. Right. Someone can be an incredible athlete, but that's not – doesn't necessarily give them the skills to teach what they know. That's so true. Some people are really good at that. That's so true. I think one of the reasons these stereotypes – these stereotypes made sense at one point because when when karate and judo were new in America, yeah, back then probably the people who knew the most were people who had learned it in Japan. Yeah, that was because true. It was the middle of the people, 20th century. People here hadn't been doing it that, right. for that long. Right. Um, 
and that continues. I think that that continues longer with traditional styles than it does with with styles where people compete. Because yeah. then you can see that oh, oh yeah, jujitsu came from Japan before it came from Brazil. Sure, and but Brazilians and Japanese don't win every tournament. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can, you know, what you want to know is, do they know what they're doing, and do they know how to teach you? Right, right, right. So, and, and that, that's those are very, very good points, and uh, that's something that you have to, you know, see for yourself. Um, yeah, just look at the uh, look at the school's resume, and see what your instructor has done, and you bring up a good point about how not everyone who's a and, lethal weapon is a good instructor. We, in our time as Crawford Guy instructors, well, we've tried to expand new markets. We've hired instructors. We've brought people in to teach our system. We've interviewed, we've had the pleasure of working with some people who are phenomenal competitors. We've had people who, you know, mm -hmm. fought in the Octagon, maybe were uh, Golani Brigade in Israel. They were, there were some people who were like really, really good as fighters, but we put them in front of a group of 12-year-olds uh, and they get eaten alive because teaching is a skill and, uh, you know, it, you have to be able to communicate mm -hmm. and be able to give that knowledge. You have to be able to explain things to people. The yeah. way they can understand. So I think if the school you're looking at doesn't let you at least take a free class, you, you should really wonder. Yeah. If they believe in what they're doing, that class they're giving you, that's that's the best sales pitch they should be able to give Love you. Love that. Free this class. is what we do. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. We have that here at ICO, by the way. And again, you don't have to choose our school, but that's something that we always have is people, can I come and watch? Absolutely. Can I take a free class? Absolutely. Here's the waiver. Bang, bang, boom. Come on in. I, I've i seen classes, I don't know if this has happened to you, but I've seen classes where, uh, and this, I don't know, I'm not going to name names, but said, this happened at a school that taught Krav Maga, well, Krav Maga near to us at our old place. Oh, yeah. They wouldn't even let you go in to see the class. You couldn't watch. No. You couldn't watch. No. No, absolutely not. Not even allowed to watch. Too dangerous. It's too top secret. Top secret. Yeah, so, yeah. Top okay. Secret. Even though it's a year before you, you see a weapon. Yeah, exactly. And you got to pay extra for that. Oh, sure. Oh, that, that, be careful with that. That, that. That's an excellent point. If you do take a practical form of self-defense, if you take, for example, say Krav Maga, look, Krav Maga by definition has to talk about what happens in reality. So you got to see knives, guns, baseball bats, assault rifles. You got to see all that stuff, improvised weapons, sticks. So if it's a year before you touch a weapon and they make you pay a special fee just to get started on that, already make for the door. I'm going to tell you that right away. There's no excuse for that because the assailant is probably, you know, these things happen every day. How can you wait a year before you're able to handle something that in America happens quite often, which is assault with a deadly weapon? That's silly. And it's irresponsible. So well, it, it should also make you wonder how much they, they know about it. Well, that's a good point. Because it's, that's a good sign, you know, like if they don't want to show you something, or they want to make it very slow that you're learning it, could be they just want to get more money out of you. Could yeah. be that they only know so much and they don't want to give it away all at once. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But there's a difference there. Like let's say uh, there's a special workshop. They're bringing in someone from outside, uh, you know, who's well known or, and they have to pay this person to deliver it. Then, I mean, that's a different thing. You know? Sure. You're, you're, that's a special thing that's happening and, you know, it's not crazy for them to – to charge extra for that. Sure. Uh, here's one. Again, I found this one online. I thought it was interesting. Um, not a deal breaker. I don't know how you, how other people run their schools. I've seen it in a couple of places. And I, I think it's funny. Not really a pet peeve of mine, but I do think it's kind of comical. Any school that has a camo belt, like a camo belt as a rank. Yeah. Like after, after this comes camo. Right. <laughs> what is your take on <laughs> I think when people start playing around with ranking <laughs> systems, look, there's some people who don't even like ranking systems at all. Right. And there's some people who will tell you that, you know, back in China or Japan, the belt was there to hold up your pants. Sure. And that the whole system was was created for over here, you know, and so they create these ranks and so you have to work your way through the ranks. and Sure, sure. You know, it's, that in itself isn't like a huge thing, but... Like I was in a Taekwondo school where they they doubled the the number of ranks, you know, because then you could get them quicker. 
Okay. You know, so you could, you could, and they would, they would test every, every couple of months. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. Then there was a fee for each one of those. Ah, uh, yeah, I think so. Oh yeah. Well, then you can obviously see why a school would do that. You know, it's a, you know, it's a form of and, you know, profits, you know, if there's like 20 different ranks you could have, you got to start wondering why, why are these here? What do all these mean? Yeah. Yeah, but I just think camel belt is just particularly. They ran out of colors is the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, they I ran saw... out of colors and like, oh, this looks cool. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And I saw, I saw again. I don't want to name names of the Shonahara, but I saw one place that had a system just for women, for girls, and it had lilac and teal and pink and all these things, and it was like pastel versions of the different colors. And I, I started thinking to myself. I found it patronizing. I don't know. I found it patronizing. I, thought, I found it. It's the kind of face I make when people tell me about girl push-ups. And I have, we have girls here on this mat of all ages, you know, pumping out knuckle push-ups like it's nothing. So I, you know, I, I think that if I showed that to these girls here, girl push-ups and lilac belts, I think they'd be thoroughly <laughs> grossed out. I think they'd be offended. It's weird, right? It's an odd thing. You know, um, here's one. You have to buy school merch. You know, if you've got to buy, I, owning a t-shirt, owning a uniform is fine. I get that. A, a desire for team cohesiveness, you know, yay us. That's fine. You be proud of your school. But if you're spending hundreds of dollars on your school merch because they took out a new tote bag and they got the new keychain and they got the the, the, the the new hoodie and that's, I've seen some schools that make most of their revenue with merch. That's not great. Not a deal breaker, but again, not great. You got to be careful with that. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Uh, I think it's, it's one thing having all that stuff, but if you have to, you can only use their stuff. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's, here's something that I, I don't like. Um, if you're going into a system and that system has kata or forms or patterns or hues or tegus, whatever it is that you're doing, palgates, I don't know, karate, taekwondo, if you have kata and you like kata, you find it meditative, you find it a uh, good exercise, you find, if you get something out of it, that's fine. All right, I'm, I'm not knocking it. But musical kata, that's a, that's a tough one for me. I, that's, I gotta tell you, I, I draw the line there. Hey, I think you got to question why you're doing it. Yeah. I think if you're if you're doing wushu or kung fu because you think it's cool. Sure. I think if it's cool, music, it's right? fun, you know, okay. But if what you want to be learning is self-defense, then is this the best way to spend your training time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and I, to my understanding, I've seen – you know, different styles of traditional Chinese Kung Fu done. And they would have uh, a full, like, traditional Chinese percussion mm. group playing as the guy would show Tiger Claw or Monkey stuff oh. like that. They would have – it's really exciting. And I think there's a, there's a cultural component to that. So I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But I had um, – what, what, what drives me nuts is the – is when every third move – there's a key eye that lasts about a minute. Yeah, man, I gotta tell you, that's that's rough. That's that's always tough for me. Um, and your I, and your bow staff <laughs> weighs about two ounces. Yeah, because it's made of graphite. Yeah, that's again, that's maybe that's just us. That's just our pet peeve. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna twirl around a weapon, I you know I'd rather be heavy. <laughs> sure, that that if that if you like that because it looks good, it looks pretty. You're doing it because it's it's it, fine. But there are people who uh, go into uh, color guard and there are yeah. people who twirl baton. They're competitive baton twirlers. And there are people who do the ribbon thing that in the Olympics. Sense. That's awesome. Fine. It's awesome. Fine. If you're doing color guard and you know that that does not make you uh, a member of the SEAL team. Right. Okay. Right. The gun you're twirling is not if you're just confusing fire. Those, those two things. Right. Right. That's annoying. Uh, I took a job when I uh, – uh, I was between jobs uh, a long time ago, and I took a job as a self-defense instructor for a small company, and they didn't even really bother to check my background or what I had done. They said, well, can you kick? Are you flexible? Sure, I can kick. Okay. Um, can you punch? Okay. 
uh, you're hired. And I, okay. And I remember one of my first sessions was to go with the guy who was train, training me. And I had to go do uh, an event for kids at a local park. He said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk in and I want you to do, uh, I want you to tumble in, do a super loud key eye, right? And then when all the kids are like staring at you, I'm going to put on a song. I, I'm pretty sure the song was, was I, Eye of the Tiger. I, yeah, oh my God, yeah. It was Eye of the Tiger. Are you serious? How did you copy anything else? No, 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 it's, it's, it's crazy that you said Eye of the Tiger. I was, it was Eye of the Tiger. It's unbelievable. Have I told you this? It, no. It's unbelievable. It was Eye of the Tiger. And and I said, okay, so you want me to do a kata to the music? I, them, I don't know any kata, but I can do moves. And you want me to match the moves to the song? I know the song. I mean, Creature of the 80s, I remember the song. I can make moves, match the music. But I've never done musical kata. It's like, wait, you said you were a black belt in your interview. It's like, I am. It's like, how did you know black belt ever having done musical kata? And that was his question to me. Mm-hmm. And that question, I, I was going to plot. I couldn't believe the question that came out of it. I didn't know how to process that question. How did I ever become a black belt uh, ever having done a musical kata? I leave that to you, the viewer. For those of you watching this video that are black belts in a particular system, how did you ever become a black belt without ever having learned a musical kata? Feel free to submit your answers, by the way. I'd love to see how you got through life while doing a musical kata.